Thank you so much, Kristen. And welcome to all of you who have joined today. I really appreciate talking to you. I'll show you a picture of my book, which he just talked about. And I know some of you have read it already. It's available on uh, Amazon. Um, but um, I, I really have enjoyed the opportunity to, to write it. Um, I'm going to have some uh, slides in a few minutes, but first I'll do a little introduction and then I'll move into the, the slides and Preston will play those. Um, oh, you, you want to show what that is like. There you go. Okay. Um, anyway, when I grew up, and Chris, yeah, thank you. There's the there's the cover of the first the first slide. So um, uh, we'll we'll go back to that for now, Kristen. You can go if if you want to just go back to my face so they can see me when I when I talk. <laughs> okay. When I grew up, I heard a lot of mention about the American dream. I heard that people should be able to uh, to just work hard and to do whatever they wanted to do in life. But I realized in my town of Brockton, Massachusetts, that there were exclusions. There were people who couldn't do what they really might want to do. And this, this concerned me from, from a very young age. For instance, um, the major employer in town were a, a, a large group of shoe factories. And Brockton had been a mecca for immigration uh, from of people from uh, many countries in Europe, uh, Italians, Swedes, Lithuanians, Germans, uh, Greek. Uh, and uh, most of those people came through chain migration. In other words, one family would come, they would be employed in the shoe factories, they would notify the family and the townspeople back home. And then those people would come and would join them in the three-decker tenement houses that had been built throughout the, the town around the, the factories. And uh, they could mostly get work there. Only men, of course, no women. Um, but I also noticed that downtown in this, uh, the store windows, when there were employment signs saying uh, uh, jobs available, work wanted, then there would be a, a little line underneath it. It might say, no Irish need apply, need apply. And that concerned me because my, my relatives were Irish. And I thought, why? Why are, they excluded? why are they excluded? That just doesn't make sense. Then I thought, well, my, name, my last name is Smith, so I must be OK. They won't know I'm Irish. I would be able to get a job there. Um, then I also saw some signs that said, no Negroes need apply. And that bothered me. Why? Just because they have different color skin it just didn't make sense. And then I realized that there was an African-American neighborhood in my town. Uh, and it was very, very poor. But I, I knew that the people in that community, the men could only get jobs as janitors or garbage collectors or ditch diggers. And the signs downtown it certainly showed that they wouldn't be able to get jobs in the, uh, the downtown area. So I assumed that maybe they couldn't get jobs in the shoe factories either. And this bothered me because they, they were strong looking. They should be able to, to work there. So I tucked all of these, this information away. And then one day I was walking downtown and I saw some factory workers carrying picket signs as they walked through the town. And on the signs, they said, we want a union contract. Give us fair wages and benefits. We demand fair working conditions, better working conditions, safe working conditions. What I didn't understand at the time was that the National Labor Relations Act had just been passed by Congress a few years earlier. And before that time, these same employees wouldn't have been able to march downtown demanding a fair contract and demanding better working conditions. And, um, but I was pleased to see that it was allowed at least at this particular point in time. And I tucked that away. What I understood most clearly 
in my childhood was that there was discrimination against women. My mother had explained to me that only a few jobs were available to women at that point in time, nursing, teaching, and secretarial work, and then good jobs in the telephone company. Uh, but uh, jobs for women paid less than similar work for men, and uh, I didn't think this was fair. Uh, I also didn't think it was fair that there were no women lawyers and judges and therefore, that maybe the, 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 the justice system wasn't, wasn't fair. I observed this because I had the occasion to accompany my mother to court on a couple of occasions in, involved in her marital uh, problems with my father. Um, and I thought that the judges, the judge and the lawyers would listen better if there were women involved in the, the proceeding. Uh, so I decided at that young age that I would become a lawyer myself and that I would work for justice and that I would, I would work for justice and employment because I, that's where I saw a need. Um, so in my, besides, my mother had told me that things were going to be better when I grew up. She said, you'll be able to do anything you want to do. You will be like Amelia Earhart. You might even be able to fly an airplane. And so I chucked all those thoughts away for, uh, to, to grow up. Uh, the rest of my story is, is, in my, is in my book. And so I won't uh, give you those details unless I have some, some time at the end of my talk. But um, what I wanted, to, it was actually what I call a zigzag life because when I graduated from high school, uh, the, the legal profession still wasn't open to women, and I was persuaded to ch choose something different, and so I became the foreign language teacher, and that was what Creston referred to. My early career was as a uh, French teacher, and I also taught English as a second language uh, to Cambodian and Vietnam uh, refugees for, uh, for two years. Um, all of that before I went to law school, which I st started when I was 34 years old. So, okay, so Kristen, if you could start the, the slides, what I'd like to tell you about is my, what I learned about the world of work in the course of my studies and um, uh, why I was more and more committed as time went on to uh, be part of the world of work to make a difference. Okay, that's the cover of my book. And as you see, the world of work is a complicated American story. So would you switch to the next slide, please? Okay, I'm gonna start off by going way back to uh, medieval Europe, um, because that's where it all began. Uh, the, in in, in uh, Europe, the monarch of each country owned all the land and distributed parcels of it to, to vassals who uh, basically uh, gave their loyalty and protection in exchange uh, for the transfer of land and the granting of a title, some kind of a title, which then could be inherited by the family of that vassal. So that's why land became very much uh, concentrated in the hands of, of a few of the uh, wealthy uh, people that were connected to uh, the monarch of, of a country. Now, uh, the, the land, of course, was rich for agriculture, and that's where the wealth would be generated from the land, but the, the wealthy vassals themselves did not till the land. They brought in peasants, serfs, who did the work. Now, those people could not buy the land. They couldn't own anything, but they worked for their rent. And they then could not establish any kind of, of ownership rights. Uh, meanwhile, the, in the towns, they, there were craftsmen who uh, built the tools, the iron tools, uh, made the clothing, the boots and leather goods, uh, wood products, even bakery goods that were needed um, on the fiefs 
by uh, the, the people that lived out in the countryside. And so they, they established their shops in the, in the villages uh, and the merchants then uh, saw, uh, sold the property items that were, that were made. Now the craftsmen wanted to protect their interest in their business. And so they banded together and they established guilds. And the purpose of the guild was to prevent uh, competition, uh, to um, establish quality controls for the items that they made, and also to, uh, to build their family interest in their business because they would pass it on then to their, their sons um, uh, upon their death. If, they, if their business grew and they needed um, to train uh, apprentices to build in new people, uh, they could build, build, bring in outsiders. Apprentices weren't paid. They were just uh, allowed to learn the, the skills uh, for, no, for no fee. And then uh, basically uh, with the hope that they would eventually become a uh, journeyman, that was the title uh, given to uh, someone who had uh, passed the tests for quality work. Uh, usually the, the sons of the young craftsmen started out as, as apprentices also and became journeymen. And then once they uh, uh, became journeymen, they could either continue to work for the craftsmen or open their own craft shop and, um, take, and take in their, their own apprentices. Uh, they would have to, in order to do that, they would have to go another step called the masterpiece. They would have to achieve some kind of quality work that qualified them as a master and then that would allow them to open up another shop and basically be in competition with uh, the first shop. Uh, the, all of this was done under a legal theory called the freedom of contract. Now eventually merchants began trading with uh, the shipbuilders to uh, bring the products the out of the local area to other countries. And that's how the industry began. And so we had um, trading take place uh, between um, the British uh, ports and uh, first of all, down in the African coast. Uh, it, was, it was not just the British that traded, but also the Portuguese and the Spanish. Um, no, we moved too far. We're, ba we're back on um, the um, slide two, which is 17th and 18th. One more. There we go. Okay. Uh, and this, this led to, uh, no, that's, one more, that this is the, the one I just went through, feudalism. I, you, you just had it, Creston, 17th and 18th. There you go, okay. Um, the first, as I say, the, uh, the plantation owners, uh, uh, the, the shipbuilders brought the, uh, the ships down, first of all, to Africa and then across to the New World. When the New World was discovered in America, what we call America today, of course, was called the New World. There were uh, so, uh, opportunities here. Now, the way that the settlers came, we've always learned that it, it was, they came for just re religious reasons to set up uh, religious communities. And this was true. I haven't moved yet. Okay. Uh, this was true that they, the settlers who chose to come on the ships tended to be uh, from religious communities. However, the way that they got their passage was by contracting with these uh, British um, uh, bankers and investors who had established companies or began, wanted to establish companies in the new world where work would be done that then would be connected with uh, the old world. So the travel that was, was fine, and after the original settlers came, like on the Mayflower, uh, they were, that was a very small community. But within a matter of just a few years, 
there was travel financed by corporations under the, the monarchy. Uh, the, one of them was called the Massachusetts Bay Company that financed travelers to Boston and New England especially. Uh, and they brought in 10,000 inhabitants by the 1640s. And the charter became a type of political constitution and established a financial relationship with the crown and led to uh, a colonial governance structure. Now it's true that the inhabitants had come for personal reasons, but they also came with skills and they established basically, they established uh, uh, shops and followed the um, uh, feudal system that had been in place uh, back in the old country. Uh, in the, the North, let's see, you're, this is, you're looking at the Southern colonies. There should be another, another slide that has the earlier. No, you go, you, you're going in the wrong direction. Go back. There's a seven, there we go. I think you skipped one. Well, we're, we're, we're getting ahead. There you go, 17th and 18th, yeah. No, back one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, small native, small farms. One uh, up, one there. Small, small family farms were mainly the way of life in Boston, in the Massachusetts community, until Boston grew, and that was very quickly uh, that Boston grew because of the uh, use of the reliance on the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, they also established. Uh, businesses and Harvard University was uh, established just in 1736, very, very early on. Um, meanwhile, as I say, the craft and merchant guilds operated on the European model. Now, when they needed additional workers, which happened very quickly, the population grew, believe it or not, to 10,000 inhabitants in Boston by the 1640s. Uh, so they, did, they needed new, new uh, workers who couldn't afford the passage on the ships to, to get there. So the tradition began of indentured servitude. And what this involved was a contract where people would get their, their passage paid for by the, the company that brought them over or by the uh, family that wanted uh, servants. Um, in exchange for a, a commitment that they would work for four to seven years for free. And um, oftentimes the servants that came under these contracts had no way to, although they were freed, freed people, they were not uh, in, uh, enslaved individuals. Uh, they were still unable to acquire property or savings. So at the end of their four to seven years, most, most of them just stayed on as servants because they were content, they had a way of life, they just were not able to acquire any property. Um, so let, now we can move to the next slide. Okay, in the South, things were a little bit different. The agricultural land uh, was richer and uh, more, lent itself more to large plantation type uh, growth of products. So the wealthy British uh, investors and, and merchants who financed uh, travel uh, acquired large parcels of land and they sent uh, people that would be able to establish plantations and, and run those plantations. So the, these were not people who came for religious reasons, like the, the uh, settlements in, in the Boston area and also uh, Rhode Island and, and Pennsylvania with the Quakers. Um, there were various religious groups that established in those Northern areas. But in the South, it was more of a, a large wealthy uh, type of investment that that was uh, planned for the, um, uh, the use of the agricultural land. And um, they raised uh, tobacco, cotton, rice, indigo, uh, 
and then sent it back uh, uh, and sold it uh, back in, in England. Uh, there, there was a strong connection to the crown. There was a, an appointment of a uh, local governor from who was British who would negotiate with the native tribes uh, to purchase these large parcels and then make them available to the uh, uh, settlers who would agree then to, um, uh, to grow the, the crops. The problem is that uh, those, these crops required large contingents of workers. And the indentured servants who came uh, were in less, uh, they supplied less than what the need was. So this is what led to the use of enslaved Africans. Um, people who were not free, but who were, uh, could be obtained through the trade of, uh, of slavery, which already existed. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. I, I'm with you. It's just that it's a bit awkward and I'm trying to mute people. I'm so sorry. It's, is that the next slide? Uh, yes, that, well, that's, that's, I can show that. Yeah. Yeah. The, and I'm, I'm ex, uh, describing what this, what the slavery was like. It was really the uh, equivalent to the sale of horses or property. And the uh, people that were brought in were people of a different race. They looked different and they were treated as if they were not um, human with the same uh, value as the white workers who were the uh, indentured servants who had been allowed to be free. So there, from, early, from an early point in time uh, in these, these plantation uh, uh, purchases, there was an, an a difference made between the quality or the value of indentured servants and the value of the enslaved people that were brought in. I believe that the next slide will be the one I was, no, I guess the, the, we've, we've skipped one. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about was that the, uh, the slave trade had begun earlier and that had been in place uh, for a period of time, bringing uh, slaves to the West Indies for sale largely in the islands of the West Indies, uh, currently Jamaica and Barbados, and also in Brazil. Large numbers had been already transported to those areas uh, before the slave trade began in the, south, the southern colonies of uh, the United States. Okay, now, now we, we're moving up to the U.S. Constitution which uh, was 1787, uh, and the negotiation took place in Philadelphia. Uh, the representatives of all of the colonies were largely property owners themselves. They, uh, they were intelligent people. They all had studied either in London or at Harvard, and they had businesses. They had farms. Uh, they were voters. They were... Um, uh, certainly interested in establishing a, uh, a government that would be uh, workable for all of the colonies. Uh, in setting up the government, they decided to establish two houses uh, in addition to the president. So there was a tripartite government structure. And the two houses would be the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, Okay, how would they choose the representatives of those two? There was a big debate between the large, large population states, which would be Massachusetts, New York by then, Pennsylvania, uh, and the small population states in the South, where the land was very large, but the number of white people on those lands was very small. Uh, so the, to make things equal after all the debate uh, among these uh, uh, representatives who came to the Constitutional Convention, uh, they worked out a great compromise. 
And what the compromise was, was that the Senate would be equal representation from all, from all 13 colonies, two representatives from each. But the House of Representatives, which was designed to give broader representation of the individuals in each um, of the, of the um, new states, would include a count of three-fifths per person for the enslaved people within their boundaries. And um, as part of the compromise, they also said the external slave trade will end in 1808, no more importing of enslaved persons after 1808. So this was the way that the Constitution made the big compromise of, uh, of including uh, the black enslaved people uh, within the, the population. But they didn't call them citizens, and they didn't have give, they didn't give them any rights. Okay, well now we can move on. Now things changed in the 19th century. Um, first of all, there there were laws that that protected the property owners uh, against runaways. If, if there were runaway uh, slaves from the um, the plantations, uh, the law would would require that uh, the uh, they be searched for and brought back. Um, and then, of course, there was an underground railroad that, that established itself because some of the enslaved people uh, learned that there were states outside of the South where the bl some black people were able to uh, be free and to um, uh, to get an education and to have have employment and not just be enslaved on the on the plantation. Uh, so this this helped some of the uh, of the people, but then the Civil War, of course, was fought uh, largely uh, over the, uh, the the rights of some states to preserve their right to. Uh, uh, to continue slavery in place. Some of the states in the meantime had, had abolished slavery within their bounds. The civil rights, uh, the, the Civil War, it took five, five years and uh, was a very difficult war, many, many deaths, but finally uh, the Union prevailed and um, took a while, but th the 13th Amendment was, was 13th Amendment to the Constitution finally uh, abolished slavery. Then uh, three years later, the black people were declared American citizens. And in the 15th Amendment in 1870, granted black men the right to vote. Uh, women, of course, white or black, still could not vote, although they were considered citizens. Uh, after the Civil War and these, these constitutional amendments were passed, uh, it still was a difficult time. The, there were um, promises made to the freed slaves uh, that they would get 40 acres and, and, and a mule. Uh, a lot of the land of the, uh, the um, plantation owners had been lost during the, uh, the war. And so that, that land was supposed to be granted to uh, the black families that, that, that had been working them, working the land. Uh, those, those promises were rescinded and um, unfortunately uh, the, the period of reconstruction was a failure. Not only did they not get the opportunity to establish their, their lives, but the Ku Klux Klan was, was uh, begun and there was uh, terrible discrimination against uh, the newly freed slaves. So now we can move to the next slide. Uh, during the war, uh, it was, there was a provision for the uh, Union, uh, in the Union Army to admit some slaves. And if they were, if they volunteered uh, to join the army, they were guaranteed that they would be freed. 
However, there was segregation, and this picture, I think, uh, shows it pretty vividly. All of the soldiers in the main part of the picture are white, and the gentleman on the far left is the only uh, black uh, soldier. So the, the tradition of segregation uh, began even at that early uh, period and continued, as you know, uh, for many, many years after that. Okay, let's continue on. Um, okay, the 14th Amendment was the one that granted the, uh, the rights to uh, the black citizens. And the language of it said that all citizens, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens. And that was, that was the guarantee then to um, uh, allow them the citizenship. And no, no, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor the equal protection of the laws. The intent of that was to allow all black persons to claim citizenship, but, uh, and that would be repudiate an old Supreme Court decision, the Dred Scott decision of 1857, which said that um, they uh, did not have rights and they were not, they did not qualify to, for citizenship. Now, even though this, the 14th Amendment was passed, there was a lot of difficulty enforcing it. Uh, as I mentioned, the KKK, the Jim Crow laws that were passed in, uh, in all of the Southern states um, made it very difficult for the black people to vote. Uh, poll taxes were enforced, literacy tests, and most of them had not been uh, educated and could not pass the literacy test. Sometimes the literacy test, even for someone who had a minimal uh, knowledge of reading and writing, uh, made it impossible for them to become citizens because it required them to quote the Constitution. Uh, they were just impossible. Uh, they were also segregated in public places. They were not allowed into hotels or restaurants, as you know. Uh, and this process continued, uh, and it was authorized by the federal uh, Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, because the theory was that separate but equal was good enough, that that would be, uh, that that gave uh, equal treatment as required by the 14th Amendment. That was passed in, in 1896 through the um, U.S. Supreme Court, and that theory continued until 1964, when uh, we finally had the end of, uh, of segregation through the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Okay, let's move on. Um, then we move on to the 19th century, and the we have rapid industrialization. Uh, the cotton gin, other machines allowed uh, rapid factory growth. Uh, we had huge investment and uh, wealth acquired by the magnets, the, the industrial magnets. Some of those uh, people were uh, civilly, civically minded and uh, granted um, donations or education. Uh, Carnegie built a series of libraries, um, but others were unethical. It excluded, exploited the workers, just built the mon monopolies and um, uh, kept all the money for the wealth, wealthy people. Uh, so th that was a, a very uh, unequal kind of uh, development of the social, social services situation in America. There was a lot of poverty and there was uh, just a tr uh, tremendous, uh, and certainly no, no rights in the workplace. There was, there was, um, Dangerous, there were dangerous working conditions and uh, uh, low pay. Chinese people were brought in to build the, the railroads, but they were not allowed to become citizens. And many states uh, passed laws once the railroads were built that required them to um, go back to China, not to live in their, in their uh, locations. So, and there was, this is also the period of Western migration. There was rapid growth of the, um, the West and uh, gold rush, gold was discovered 
And so people came for that. And California grew. We, as we acquired the, um, the, the Southwest, as you know. So there was growth of the uh, country as well as the uh, industry, but without a lot of supervision and a lot of protection for the workers. It was literally the Wild West in many ways. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, the early efforts to bargain collectively. We're still in the 19th century now, and um, the, there were some efforts to collectively bargain uh, in some of the uh, industries that came up. Um, but they were declared illegal. Uh, there was, this was a violation of the freedom of contract that I spoke of earlier. And so therefore courts upheld the uh, the freedom of contract and said that if the if management in a particular industry did not want to talk to the representatives of the workers, they didn't have to do it. And there were many strikes and those strikes were declared illegal and many of the uh, representatives, union representatives were jailed. Eventually the criminal uh, violation, the, the criminal uh, uh, laws were eliminated and it became a civil matter, uh, but injunctions could issue and that would be, have the same effect. It would prevent the unions from uh, organizing the workers. Uh, and uh, there, were, there was, unless the companies were voluntarily uh, willing to meet with representatives of the unions, there was just no, no opportunity to do that. Uh, as during that same period of time, there was a lot of immigration going on because there was poverty in Europe. There were opportunities in America. America was seen as the golden uh, opportunity. The streets were paved with gold. They, the people could come on cheap steerage on ships where families were able to uh, work together to try to uh, make it possible for young people to get onto the ramp to a ship and get to America. Chain migration gradually grew. All of this happened uh, during the industrial period before the unions were authorized to, to negotiate. Meanwhile, women, women were beginning to work in uh, the industries as well. And uh, we've all heard of women sweat working in sweatshops, especially in the textile industry. Some of them worked at home during peace, peace work. And of course they worked many hours uh, for very low pay, and there were also children that were, that were employed. It all came to a head in 1911 when there was a huge factory fire in New York City called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. 140 women were killed in that fire because they had been uh, working at their, uh, their machines, their, their stitching machines, under closed conditions, the doors were locked. They were above the level of the fire escapes. Their, their, the floors where they worked were at the eighth, eighth and ninth floor level, and the fire escapes only came to the sixth level, so sixth floor level. So even though the emergency fire uh, responders came, they couldn't help these 140 women. This raised public concern and enraged the community. And frankly, that was when the, ch the tide began to change and people began to realize we must allow collective bargaining for better conditions. Okay, you can go ahead on. And this is a picture, it's not really a, uh, a um, sweatshop, but it does show how women were working in industry uh, and, uh, and certainly close together and uh, uh, without a lot of privacy. Okay, go ahead. So things happened now in the 20th century. First of all, World War I hit, and uh, after the war, uh, there was tremendous economic growth. The Roaring Twenties uh, happened, and uh, everybody was very successful, and uh, the, the, the 
stock markets were, were booming. And so it was uh, a period of, of great growth in industry. Uh, but then that all came to a uh, crashing end when the depression hit in 1929. There was widespread unemployment, business closures, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president uh, and established the New Deal legislation, which was the major change that we now enjoy the fruits of today. Uh, new agencies were created, the Workmen's uh, Project Progress Administration, the uh, CCC, unemployment insurance was admitted, was, uh, was begun. And the big thing that was of interest to me was that in 1935, the National Labor Relations Act was enacted that allowed collective bargaining in the private sector. And, in for, and they also established the National Labor Relations Board to enforce the worker rights, the right to organize workers and then uh, to require that the uh, employers negotiate with the representative of the uh, workers that was selected. They did not, they, the, the employers are not required to reach an agreement, but they're required to negotiate in good faith. And the uh, National Labor Relations Board enforces those rights. Uh, and so the benefits that employees began to acquire through the negotiations uh, really changed uh, the American workforce and led to really the growth of um, the golden, what I call the golden age of the middle class in America. Okay, we can go ahead and move on. After the worker, the people, the soldiers came back from World War II. Oh, here we go. Okay. Uh, World War II hit in 1941 with Pearl Harbor. And at that point, uh, women be were invited back into the workforce because men were off, were, were drafted and were, were off into uh, the Army and the Navy. Uh, and meanwhile, the weapons factories needed workers and the airplane factories needed workers. So women were admitted as employees and the image of Rosie the Riveter became uh, their symbol, which really showed people that women could do the work of men. Uh, they just had not been allowed to do it before. Uh, however, 1945, servicemen returned at the end of the war. All of a sudden, women were out work again. And the whole social uh, acceptance of women in the workplace changed. Uh, but it was accepted for many, many years uh, because the families were enjoying the middle class life. Uh, there was a plethora of, of development, uh, housing development. Families could buy automobiles, new appliances, and uh, at least in the fa for the factory workers who were uh, in unions, their wages were uh, established at acceptable levels. Uh, so the highest level of the middle class was in the 1960s and 1970s, when all of this became very uh, uh, fruitful. Okay, we can go ahead. Uh, then the public sector unions began to be established in various states, started in Wisconsin, uh, and by the mid-1970s, I think by 1980, um, there were 45 states and the federal government that had uh, enacted uh, statutes that allowed public workers, teachers, police officers, fire, firefighters, uh, public employees like librarians and um, uh, workers in city hall to join unions. There was tremendous growth. And during um, that same period, there was some, there was a downturn beginning in the private sector unions. Uh, the Taft-Hartley Act had been uh, passed by Congress uh, 10 years after the, um, the National Labor Relations Act, and that allowed them, authorized the right to work concept 
uh, and so the the the, the states the employees of the management had opportunities to um, not negotiate very effectively and that um, and in some states of course in the south there was no authorization for public sector um, unions and that still exists that situation still exists today that there's uh, there are states that do not have public sector unions in place so the golden age of the middle class workers uh, really was in the 60s and 70s and began to decline from that point on except for the public sector workers in uh, 45 states. Uh, but many blacks were still denied those opportunities for other reasons besides the employment uh, situation. There were neighborhood restrictions that had been put in place, uh, deed restrictions that kept them out of certain, uh, from buying property, buying houses in certain neighborhoods. There was denial of borrowing in by some banks. Uh, and unfortunately, the unions were sometimes complicit in limiting the options of, of uh, people of color. Uh, so the situation of racism uh, became more and more difficult uh, and uh, active uh, as unions became uh, less active. All right, let's continue. I think we're almost done because, and it's almost the end of my time too. But uh, the other, other employment laws were passed in the 60s and thereafter that helped with the discrimination situation. The Equal Pay Act required equal compensation for women whose work involves substantially equal skill. This is the language of the law. Substantially equal skill, effort, and responsibility under similar working conditions. It sounds good. However, the, it has had, as you know, a lot of loopholes and we still don't have equal pay. Uh, for for women in uh, in most areas. 1964 was the big year. The Civil Rights Act, especially Title VII, which prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, and sex. And the sex issue was something that was added at the last minute before Congress voted for the law, uh, and it was put in there by a legislator who was. Uh, wanted to kill the bill. Uh, he, he was opposed to racial uh, inclusion and um, uh, thought that by putting in sex as a uh, pro protected classification, the bill would be killed, will it passed. And that was what opened the door to women's life uh, in the workplace. Uh, and then the Fair, um, Fair Housing Act came in 1968, which prohibited the Lending uh, Discrimination, Merck's Disabilities Act in 1993, Family and Medical Leave Act 1993 also. Uh, all of these laws are laws which improved the conditions of working people. Okay, we can move to the next slide. I think I've already told you about my early observations my, uh, during my childhood. Um, I was discovered, discouraged from becoming a lawyer um, early on because I was told it was men's work and I'd never be able to get a job anyway. Uh, and so I, that's why I became a foreign language instructor. Uh, I finally was able to enter law school at the age of 34 because of uh, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I was very fortunate that I was mentored by one of my professors who was a well-known very highly respected labor arbitrator in the Pacific Northwest, Carlton Snow. And I was uh, very fortunate to, be, to ask him for advice on how I could uh, structure my own career so that I could become a labor arbitrator as well. First thing he said to me was, you're a woman and there are no women in this field. It's for gray haired men like me. Um, but if you want to try, I'll give you a roadmap. Uh, so what I did, I followed his roadmap. I practiced, I opened my own private office uh, and I pr did uh, employment discrimination law representing uh, employees who alleged discrimination based upon all the cl protected classifications, race, color, sex, religion. 
I became a land use hearings officer, so I learned how to conduct hearings. I also took mediation training and I did some mediation. And finally, in 1985, I qualified as a labor arbitrator on the uh, national and state lists. And I also was retained as a, on contract with the United States Postal Service as an arbitrator throughout the Pacific Northwest. I was on my way. I then had a 32 year career as a labor arbitrator. So that's my story. Thank you for letting me tell you. And uh, I, I hope you all have a very good day.